there was a, a man that had a serious problem and he decided to go to a priest and he told the priest, I, th I think I'm possessed by a devil. And the priest said, why? Because I hear voices. I hear voices in my head. What do you hear? He said, I hear, do this, do that, hurry up. The priest said, you're not possessed, you're just married. So I have four degrees, English literature, philosophy, theology, and jokeology. <laughs> it's a good one, right? Okay, so this evening, uh, I'll try to be as succinct as possible. I'd like to cover three basic ideas tonight. in our spiritual exercises program. First is I'd like to talk briefly about St. Ignatius of Loyola. And I have a first class relic of St. Ignatius. That means one of his bones. What do you think about that? So we have St. Ignatius with us. He's with us. What a privilege, right? The second part of my talk will be <clears throat> explaining our program, our protocol. So we, we know what we're doing. Some of you have done the exercises with me, some have, so you know more or less our method. Others are new. So I'd like to explain, what does this program consist in? And I'd like to give you some ideas on how to have a prayer period that we call a holy hour. I didn't say happy hour. <laughs> I said a holy hour. Then the third part of our talk will be your meditations for this week, which is principle and foundation. So you're going to be meditating upon what is called principle and foundation. So I'd like to explain to you what that is and how you can understand and live out one of the most important biblical spiritual principles in the world given to St. Ignatius. And we'll give out a holy card a beautiful holy card that one of our workers made for you with a beautiful picture of St. Ignatius receiving the exercises from the Blessed Virgin Mary in the cave of Manresa. So we'll give you a very beautiful card as we start off our, our journey. So that's our menu, okay? That's our spiritual manual for the evening. Okay, so let's start off with who was and is Saint Ignatius of Loyola. We've got part of his, his body with us. So for you to understand the exercises you have to understand, at least to a limited degree, who is 
the saint that God chose. For you to understand the interior castle of Teresa of Avila, or the story of the soul of the little flower, you have to know a little bit about the saint. Amen? To know the diary of St. Faustina, you have to know a little bit about St. Faustina. So I'll give you a, a thumbnail sketch of St. Ignatius, and then invite all of you to, to read his life. There are many, many, many biographies. To read his life. And I would suggest also, from the Philippines, five years ago, they made a really good movie on St. Ignatius. Made in Manila, in the Philippines. So, those things. Read his life, and watch a good movie on the life of this great saint. St. Ignatius was not born a saint. Like us, he was born a sinner. Amen? He was not born a saint, he was born a sinner. When I was a child, I, th I thought saints lived in a different atmosphere. I thought that they floated in the air, they didn't have to go to the bathroom, they ate once a year. <laughs> this is my infantile, childish interpretation of a saint, but the saints are sinners. And he was a big one. He and, uh, and St. Augustine would have gotten along pretty well together before their conversion. <laughs> A writer says that St. Ignatius probably broke all the commandments. So he lived a pretty spicy life. He liked wine, he liked women, and he liked to dance, too. Wine, women, and dance, that was his life before God intervened. By profession, he was, he was a Spanish soldier and a good soldier. He was proud, he was arrogant, he was a fighter. He is one of the few saints that, that spent more than one time in jail. <laughs> So he was, I think that the cholos of Hawaiian gardens would be afraid of this guy. I think they would. <laughs> I'm from the gardens, okay? He was tough. But God intervened with what is called a providential accident. How about that for English? No? A providential accident. He was in the Battle of Pamplona, and he was fighting against the French. His, his soldiers said, we can't win this battle. The French have better artillery, and they're more numerous. We can't win it. Ignatius was an a romanticist, an idealist, if you know literature, <laughs> he said, we're going to win the battle. So they put up a good fight. And then the movie made in the Philippines excellent. You see, he's defending the castle of Pamplona, and the French are drawing closer and closer with their cannons, their bayonets, their horses, their rifles, and they're shooting, and Ignatius is finishing off one after the other that's arrived at the top of the castle, then all of a sudden, you see this cannon 
and they're aiming, this cannonball goes right through the wall and right to the legs of St. Ignatius, shattering his legs. He's taken back to his home in Loyola. He's got two shattered legs. And the doctors have to do an operation. Without anesthesia. Are you fainting? They had to break his leg. And then he was very vain. He noticed that there was a bone that was jutting out beneath his knee, probably about an inch. And he was uh, a woman's man, very proud, proud as a peacock. And he said, that doesn't look very good. They told, he told the doctors to saw the bone off without anesthesia. His brother almost fainted. They got the saw and they started and they cut the saw, the bone off, and he just gritted his teeth. You see the moral and physical strength of this guy? He's not even converted yet. Once he places this energy to serving God, nothing's going to stop him. He's got a will of iron, but he's not using his energy in the right place. But he will. And I think all of us have a lot of energy, but we're dissipating it in places where we're not utilizing the spiritual energy that God has given us to the max. Amen? That's why we have the exercise. We want to utilize our spiritual TNT energy to glorify God, to sanctify ourselves, and to save a lot of souls. Amen? Amen. So his conversion is going to come about through this providential accident and also by reading. Now all of us here, we know how to read. How many people knew how to read in Europe 500 years ago? He's living from 1491 to 1556, okay? 1491 to 1556, so the, most of his life was the 16th century. Very few people knew how to read. He knew how to read. So he was in bed, recovering very slowly. So he asked one of his relatives to bring him some books. What type of books? Telenovela. Yeah? The romance literature of the Middle Ages. The damsel in distress. And the knight in shining armor who came to the rescue. He and Teresa of Avila both love that type of literature. Teresa of Avila, too. But his sister couldn't find any telenovela. She brought, she brought him The Life of Christ by Ludolf of Saxony and the Flora Sanctorum, Latin for the Lives of the Saints. And you know what he did? He spent a lot of time just imagining himself with a beautiful queen of Spain, that one day he would be there in the royal palace and he'd be Mr. Famous. He was imagining the poetic sonnets that he would cite to her. <laughs> and when he did this, he, he experienced 
a lot of pleasure on the surface of his soul. But then he was cast into a state of, you ever hear the word? Desolation. Desolation. But then he started to read the lives of the saints. An explosion of the Holy Spirit took place in his soul. And he started to read and he fell in love with the saints. And he said this, well, if St. Francis can do it, so can I. If St. Dominic can do it, so can I. If St. Augustine can do it, so can I. If the Desert Fathers had long hair, I'll have longer hair. <laughs> if they had grease underneath their fingernails, I'll get even more grease. I'll beat them. No? So he was motivated to change by reading the lives of the saints. And then something happened. What you're going to be learning in this course is you're going to be learning the art of prayer. That's the essence of these exercises, the art of meditation, contemplation, examination of conscience, the art of prayer. But you're going to be learning something else. The art of spiritual discernment. You hear me? The art of spiritual discernment. Discerning between the two different spirits that are working on you at all times. One spirit leads you to desolation and then to sin. Another one leads you to the Holy Spirit and holiness of life. You're going to be learning how to, keep up, keep, how to pick up the vibes. Las malas ondas y las buenas ondas. Amen? Pick up the good vibes, accept them. Pick up the bad, vi bad vibes and reject them. And that's what happened when he was recovering. He noticed that when he thought about his life and his romance and his winning over the Queen of Spain, he experienced pleasure, but then he was cast into desolation. But when he read the lives of the saints, he experienced great joy, great peace, great desire to become a great saint like the saints that he read. And he noticed his eyes were opened a little bit, and he noticed some of these thoughts brought him to desolation, others brought him to consolation. And from that we have the 14 rules for spiritual discernment, which are the best rules in the whole world, and we'll be explaining them to you. We'll be giving you the rules for discernment during the course of these exercises. All right. He finally recovers enough to be able to walk and to travel. And now he becomes a pilgrim. And he decides he wants to thank God for, recover, for giving him recovery. And he's going on pilgrimage to the Marian Benedictine Monastery of Montserrat. Okay? Montserrat was a Benedictine Marian sanctuary on the top of a hill. So he's traveling there, and he bumps into a into a Muslim. Into a Muslim. They start to talk about theology. And they're both on a mule. And the Muslim is listening to Ignatius, who defends the perpetual virginity of Mary, one of Mary's dogma. And the Muslim says, That's crazy. That's crazy. 
Ignatius got so angry that the mules were heading to a fork. He said, if my mule follows him in that direction, I will kill him in honor of Mary. <laughs> but if he goes in the other direction toward the sanctuary, he's safe. Thanks be to God that the mule was a Catholic mule. <laughs> it's a Catholic mule that had studied the fifth commandment. Okay, so there in Montserrat, what was he doing? Praying, hours of silence, fasting, doing penance. And especially, this is the key, this is the key, you might say, happening in Montserrat. He was examining his conscience was examining his conscience because he had a good 25, 26 years of living a pretty sinful life. So he arrives at the point where he's ready to make a confession. He finds a priest and he goes to confession. Think about how long it takes you to go to confession. Okay? I usually hear four to five hours every day. Okay? Most three, four, or five minutes. Doesn't take a long time. His confession took four to five days. I think after the priest was ready to be buried. <laughs> I think the priest, if he lived in LA, would be a permanent resident of Forest Lawn. Okay. <laughs> For all souls, huh? But really the priest, the priest was blown away. Thank you. The priest was blown away at the delicacy of the conscience of this kind of weird guy who walked with a limp. Now look, conversion. Conversion, my friends, there's a radical conversion, but there's a gradual conversion. All of us, we're going to be going through a conversion in these 10 weeks. And I think after 10 weeks, if you look at yourself in a spiritual mirror, you're not going to recognize yourself. Honestly, if you look at yourself in a spiritual mirror after Easter, because this is going to take us right through Lent into Easter, the best time to do the exercise. You've chosen the best time. If you're open to God's grace, if you're open to God's grace, you're going to look in the mirror and say, that's not me. That's not me. In, a, in the good sense of the world, we're going to be going through a, a radical conversion in these 10 weeks of the way we think, the way we feel, the way we act. Even our intentions will be different. So that's Montserrat in a nutshell. Then he goes from Montserrat to a cave nearby called Manresa. Manresa. Now, when he's in Montserrat, he's experiencing a lot of consolation because of his prayer, his general confession. In Manresa, the opposite. And I'm going to tell you a, a spiritual principle. Before major victories, the devil will try to throw up roadblocks. Probably a lot of you thought today, I'm not going to go. And maybe arriving here, you found some difficulty. So before major obstacles, the devil will often place roadblocks. So in Manresa, 
Ignatius was tempted by the devil to scrupulosity. Scrupulosity. He was tempted to give up. He was tempted to despair. He was tempted to commit suicide. It was that bad. But the saving grace was he would open up and talk to talk to a priest. He talked to a spiritual director, which is very important. When you're going through desolation, you got to talk to someone. That's why young people commit suicide. They don't know where to go. You got to talk to someone. Once you talk it out, you feel much better. And the devil can turn a molehill into a mountain. He does that. So, you're going to be getting a prayer card of what I will explain right now. In the midst of this desolation, he's praying in the cave of Manresa, And he has an apparition. The blessed, the blessed Virgin Mary appears to him and gives to him the spiritual exercises that you're going to be doing. The spiritual exercises come from the Blessed Virgin Mary. Aren't you happy about that? I'm an oblate of the Virgin Mary. I'm very happy about that. Whenever we can get close to Mary, we're in good hands, no? We're going to be consecrating these exercises to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Amen? Amen. So she gives him the exercise. You're going to get a prayer card where you see my founder looking and St. Ignatius kneeling down and writing down, writing down the spiritual exercise. After that, He's given the exercises, and he starts to give the exercises to people. But he wanted to, he wanted to get to know the fifth gospel. What's the fifth gospel? Going to Jerusalem, the Holy Land, okay? That's known as the fifth gospel. You see where Jesus was born in person. You see where we walked on Lake Galilee. You see where he turned water into wine. You see where he was crucified. You see where he rose from the dead. So he finally arrived after many obstacles, and then they told him, go home. He said, I'm not going to go home. If you don't, you will be excommunicated. So he returns to Europe, and he's giving the spiritual exercises to young and old, to the simple and the well-educated, to clerics, to priests. And these exercises are radically transforming lives in 30 days. 30 days. Lives, a 180 degree U-turn. In 30 days. In 30 days. Problem. Problem. The Spanish Inquisition the Spanish Inquisition, problem. Do you know how much education St. Ignatius had when he was given the exercises? Fourth grade. So they say, what are you doing? You're not a bishop. You're not a priest. You're not a monk. You're not a deacon. You're not a subdeacon. You're not even an altar boy. (laughs) 
So they told him, stop giving the exercises. He kept giving the exercises, and they threw him in jail. He got out, kept giving the exercises, threw him in jail again. And he recognized he had to go back to school. So we went back to school in Alcala. Then he went to a place to get his high school, beginning of college education in Salamanca. Salamanca. Then he ends up in the most prestigious university in the world where Thomas Aquinas taught 300 years earlier, which would be the University of Paris. Okay. Now when he's there, he's giving the exercises and lives are being transformed. And there's young men that are so impressed by him that they're starting to follow him. They really like him. He's kind of weird, but they, he's a weird person, but he's a saint. He's a weird person, but he's a saint. And he ends up with two roommates at the University of Paris. If you know basic psychology, one was an introvert, another was an ext extrovert. The introvert was a very shy, insecure, fearful individual. But he was a genius, okay? He was a genius. Ignatius took him through the 30 days. He was radically transformed and he became the greatest expert in the exercises given them after St. Ignatius. Pope Francis canonized him three years ago. St. Peter Favre, okay? Then there was another one, his other companion was the exact opposite. He was an extrovert, he was strong, handsome, attractive, he was a party animal. If he lived today, he would, he would have made it to the Olympics and won a gold medal in the high jump. He was, al he was also a genius but a different type. Gifted with languages, a doctorate in philosophy, and Ignatius tried to get this guy to do the exercises, but he said, I don't want to do that. Get out of here. So he gets his doctorate in philosophy, and he starts to teach, and Ignatius says, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? He keeps repeating that. And he's rebuffed by this party animal. Then Ignatius, what does he do? He sends students to his classes and he, he gives them money. He's going to win them over because he believes if this man does the exercises, he's got so many natural gifts he could end up by saving many, many, many souls. So finally this guy gives him, Ignatius takes him through the exercises. He said he was the hardest nut to crack. <laughs> the hardest nut to crack. So Ignatius forms <coughs> a little group of seven young men and they make vows in France 
they go to the Pope. They ask the Pope if the Pope could bless this new group. Spanish is called La Compañía de Jesús. In English, the Company of Jesus, we also call them the Jesuits. And the Pope approves of this new religious congregation, and he brings these seven men to Rome. The Pope wanted to send priests out to do missionary work. And he asked his friend, who was the arrogant, the proud individual who is now his best friend. The Pope says, send some people to India. So two of them get sick, and he turns to his friend and says, would you be willing to go? And he says, I will obey. Ignatius looks at him, and he sends him off with these words, go set all on fire. Go set all on fire. He traveled to Portugal, got in a boat, he ends up in a place called Goa in India, and he's preaching and teaching and baptizing so many that he can barely lift up his arm. India was not enough. Got to go to Malaysia. Malaysia was not enough. He goes to Japan. And he thought, I can convert these Japanese. But if I convert the Chinese, the Chinese will convert the Japanese. So they're overlooking mainland China. This young man gets a fever and he dies overlooking China. He dies all alone, and his name is the greatest missionary in the Catholic Church after St. Paul. You've heard of him. His name is St. Francis Xavier. So I've told you, my friends, the story of our patron saint. And what he wants of all of you is this. He wants all of you to become great saints. Amen? Amen? He wants all of you to become great saints. We are living in the most difficult times in the history of the world. And none of us can doubt that. We are living in the most difficult times in the history of humanity. So now more than ever, we need saints. And you have to be that. You have to be that saint. The greatest novelist of the 19th century, his name was Charles Dickens. Right. And David Carpelfield, as well as the Christmas Carol, right? Oliver Twist, great writer. I like to quote him. He says, the worst of times can be the best of times. Amen? Amen? The worst of times can be the best of times if we're walking with Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and the angels and the saints. Amen? Amen. So there you have a thumbnail sketch of our holy patron. Okay, our program. Our program can, div can be divided into three parts. You might even call it a spiritual tripod. Okay? Spiritual tripod. And it's this. First is our presentation. Tonight is, we're going to be a little bit longer than the other sessions but you'll have a presentation which will give you an orientation as to what you're going to be doing during the course of the week. I'll give you the theme of the week. 
then at the end of the presentation, you'll be given out a handout on the topic, on what you're going to be meditating upon. Okay, the second will be your daily meditation. I call it our daily holy hour. One of my favorite, favorite writers and preachers that I quote constantly is, maybe you've heard of him, Archbishop Venerable Fulton J. Sheen. I met him in person. <laughs> I'm betraying my age. Uh -huh. yeah. He calls it the holy hour, the hour of power. The hour of power. You know when, where, and how he died? December 9th, 1979, Manhattan. He died in front of the Blessed Sacrament in his private chapel. Amen? How about that? He who preached the Holy Hour, his last hour was in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and he died. I like that. I like that. Imagine that he dies, and he wakes up, and he sees Jesus Christ looking at him face to face. Welcome home. Welcome home, you faithful servant. Okay, and the third part is we're going to be having a sharing session. So after my talk today, we're going to be dividing into groups. And you'll have your own group. And one of the requirements is, as Father Thomas said very clearly, you're going to have to wear your, your, your mask, obey the archbishop, and obey the guidelines of our diocese, okay? Hopefully we'll be able to get rid of them before too long, but right now, as Father Thomas pointed out, there are still, still dangers, okay? So you're going to have a sharing session. You'll break up into groups today to get to know who is your facilitator, where you're going to go, and we'll give you your meditation. Got that? All right. Your holy hour. So I'm going to give you some points on your holy hour. I didn't say happy hour, I said holy hour, okay? Are you listening? Okay, number one is this. The heart of this program is your holy hour. Okay? And as I mentioned in my homily, quoting Teresa of Avila, we have to have a determined determination to be faithful to our prayer period. You have to have a determined determination. A determined determination. So on a daily basis, you're going to be making your holy hour. Okay, listen. As a priest, a preacher, a teacher, a writer, okay? I can teach all of you how to pray, and I can do it pretty well. I'm not tooting my horn, but I can. I could go on until midnight talking about prayer. I could. But I cannot give you the desire to pray. I can't give you that. Sorry. One of the greatest graces I received in my life, ever since I was a little child, I always liked to pray. The only person I ever heard that said that she liked to pray like that was my mother. May God bless her. So I cannot give you the desire to pray, but I can teach you. So you have to beg 
Mary, beg St. Therese, beg St. Ignatius for the desire to want to pray. And I hope and pray during these exercises that you will have a real longing for prayer. Psalm 41.1, as a deer yearns for the running streams, so my soul yearns for you, O Lord my God. Psalm 41.1. Okay, so let's talk about where, when, how, and why. The way we interpret so- short stories in literature, right? <laughs> okay, when. Are you listening? My suggestion. As early as possible. Have any of you ever read Mark chapter 1? Mark chapter 1. It's a typical day in the life of Jesus. It says that he got up way before dawn and was absorbed in prayer. I repeat, way before dawn and was absorbed in prayer. I repeat, he was, he got up way You hear me? He got up way before dawn and was absorbed in prayer. I'm hearing some of you say for me, no way! Yes way, huh? <clears throat> St. Faustina, the diary, she said, whenever I put it off for later, either I didn't do it or I did it poorly. Yeah. St. Faustina, they put it off later, or either she skipped it or she did it poorly. You want to give God your first fruits, right? Do you remember Cain and Abel? What did Cain do? His leftovers. What about Abel? His first fruits. Who are you? Cain or Abel? I think I know your name. Can Abel, huh? <laughs> Cut out Cain and be an Abel. Give the Lord your first fruits. Give the Lord your first fruits. A place. You know, I'm in a very special place. I've I've given retreats at the uh, Carmelite House, I'd say a good 15 years, Mary, something like 15 years, eight-day retreats. So I know the terrain here, mas o menos. I think there's an adoration chapel here. Is it still available? Is it open at 10 o'clock in the morning? Earlier? 24 hours? Aha! (laughs) Ask Father Thomas to build the bigger one, okay? (laughs) That's the ideal place. That's the ideal. If you can do it in front of the Blessed Sacrament, that's the ideal. If not, most of you cannot, I know, because of your family obligations. Some place in some place where you have silence. If you don't have silence, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Silence. Then create for yourself your little, your own little chapel or oratory. None of you are are Jehovah Witnesses, right? (laughs) Ocala no desfrazado. 
So have an image of Mary. Have an image of divine mercy. Have an image of the sacred heart. Have an image of Saint Joseph. Then, maybe light a candle. Maybe burn a little bit of incense, but not marijuana. (laughs) You want to create the spiritual milieu, the spiritual ambience, huh? And then, okay, you're going to have, you're going to have a meditation for every day. So you're not going to be doing your novena to St. Fulgensis of Rospe, okay? You're not going to be reading your Pieta. You're not going to be praying your rosary at that time. But rather, you're going to be following, follow the rules. And we're going to be giving you, I wrote out already two programs. This is my second program. We're going to be giving you a lot, okay? Okay, 95% is the Bible. And then my explanation of the biblical passage related to the exercises. Okay, follow a method. Follow a method. I can give you various methods. I'll give you the method that I've been promoting on my perseverance talk in the morning the past year. You're first going to place yourself in the presence of God, pray to Mary, then beg the Holy Spirit. Beg the Holy Spirit to give you light. Then... Well, I'll give you what was given by Pope Benedict XVI in his document, Verbum Domine. And it's called Lectio Divina. You can use the principles of Lectio Divina. And they would be Lectio, Meditatio, Contemplatio, Oratio, Axio. Okay, I gave you a little bit of Latin there, right? So translate that into English. Lectio, you got to read. You got to read. Meditatio, meditate. You got to think. Think through the passage. Contemplatio. What's that? Im- cont- Im- Im- use your imagination. Use your imagination. Imagine that you're there in the scene. Oratio. Pray. Now go from the head to the heart. That's the biggest and most difficult journey to go from the head to the heart. In oratios, open up your heart and talk to God. You might even write in in parentheses, colloquy. Colloquy means a heart-to-heart conversation with the Lord. Then axio, put it into practice. So go from eyes to mind to heart to feet, okay? Putting into practice. Then after you've finished, have a notebook, write down what did God say to you? What did God say to you What was the message that God gave to you during your holy hour? And each and every one of us is different. 
God's going to speak to all of you in a different way. You have to be open to the Holy Spirit. That is called the, the writing down is called revision. You know English well. Re would be the prefix, vision would be the rest of the word. It means to see again. So go back and see what God said to you. Write it down. Then when you come for your sharing group, you're going to choose one of those seven meditations and you're going to be sharing that with the rest of the group. Got it? Hello? So there we have it. Okay. Finally, your meditation this week, your meditation this week is called Principle is called Principle and Foundation. Principle and Foundation. Beg for the grace to do this well because this is the whole, this is the whole foundation of the program. Principle and Foundation. Okay, this responds to these philosophical, theological questions. Who is God? Who are you? Why are you, why are you, why are you here in this world? What's the purpose of your life? What is the end of your life? And what are the steps you have to take to arrive at the purpose of your life? This is very, very, very important. If you understand this, you meditate upon it, you assimilate it, and it becomes a part of who you are, then all of your thoughts, decisions, actions in life are going to be motivated by principle and foundation. Everything I do in my life is motivated by this philosophical, theological principle called principle and foundation. Everything I do. Okay, why, why, am, I, why am I here for 10 weeks? I'm going to be as simple as possible. I'm here because I want to praise God. Amen? I want to praise God. Started off with the Mass, which is the greatest means we can praise God in this world, is by the Mass. Nothing greater. I'm here, and this is not selfish, but I'm here because as a result of this, I want to become a saint. That's why I came. I want this experience to sanctify me as a priest, a religious, a preacher and teacher. But I also I'm here because I want all of you, I want all of you to become great saints. Amen? Amen. I'm very ambitious in that sense. I want all of you to become great saints. I am living out right now principle and foundation. That's principle and foundation. Praising God. Praising God. Personal sanctification. And loving what God loves, which is the salvation of souls. Go set all on fire. Go set all on fire. 
Those are the last words that St. Ignatius said to Francis Xavier. They never saw each other until they got to heaven. Go set all on fire. So principal foundation, you're going to be getting a little card. And it's only about, a, I've never counted, but it's probably about 100 words. This is why you're here. You're here to praise God, to reverence God, to serve God, and by means of that, to save your soul. I repeat, this is, this is the purpose of your existence. You are here for one purpose. Your life on earth should be a means by which you are praising God. And as I said, when we celebrate Mass, there's nothing greater in the world than praising God. Do you know anything about angels? Not the baseball play team that plays in Anaheim, okay? <laughs> Do you know the highest choir of angels? They're called the seraphim and the cherubim. We have a garden angel, which is the lowest of all the angels would be the guardian angel. You know what the cherubim and the seraphim do for all eternity? They are in front of the Blessed Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, like the vision of Isaiah, the first reading last week, right? What are they doing? They are praising, worshiping, glorifying the Trinity for all eternity. That's the only thing they do. And of all the actions, praising God is the highest of all actions. Of all the prayers you can do, there's no greater prayer than that of praise. And I repeat, in Mass, it's the most sublime way in which you can be praising God. You're called to reverence God. You're called to reverence God. Do you remember Moses when he came before the burning bush? Remember that? He heard the voice, take off these sandals. You're walking on holy ground. And he bowed down in reverence before the burning bush which is symbolic of the Eucharist and the perpetual virginity of Mary, right? How about to serve God? If you are praising God with your lips, you should be serving God with your hands and feet. The exercises are going to be transforming the way we deal with other people. And when you're dealing with other people, before you do something, is this going to help that person to get to heaven? That thought. Is this what I'm going to do? Is this going to help my son or daughter to get to heaven? Should, should, I, should I send my son or daughter to Harvard, Princeton, or Yale, or Dartmouth, or a community college, Cerritos Community College in Southern California. Maybe best just to stick with the community college. Maybe. Gets a degree from Harvard or, you know, the Ivy Leagues on the East Coast. Gonna have a head the size of a watermelon, right? 
but lose, your daughter's going to lose her faith in the same time. Is it really worth it? Your daughter's about to get married. Is that future husband going to help her to become a saint? Talk to her about that. Bring her to me. Bring her to me. (laughs) Bring her to me. Oh, yeah. Bring her to me. You think that that man is going to be the bridge by which you can get to heaven? Not drop him like a hot potato. Bang! <laughs> see, see how principle and foundation motivates me in all these important decisions. All these important decisions. It's going to change your whole outlook in life. You know, my friends. We are what we think. Whether you, what you, whether you agree with that or not, you are what you think. If you have wrong thoughts, then you're going to have wrong actions. If you have wrong actions, you're going to be forming what are called vices. And you're going to have a corrupt personality, and you're going to lose your soul. Yep. That's Principle and foundation, the basic principle. You are here for one purpose, praising God. Reverence God. Serve God. By means of that, to save your soul. Then principle and foundation continues with what is called the law of tantum quantum, which means the proper, the proper use, the proper use of creation. Everything that God created is good, right? So why do you have evil? If everything that God created is good, why is there evil? Because instead of using it for its proper end, we abuse it. And the most obvious one today, this is a no-brainer, is the abuse of human sexuality. That's the biggest one today. You can even see the abuse of human sexuality is the abuse of principle and foundation. Sex isn't a (laughs) plaything. Are you kidding? That's the means by which God decides to bring a new person into the world with an immortal soul. Wow. A woman with a baby in her womb, the highest reverence for me. Baby in the womb of a mother, wow. And I remember, I'm one of nine, my mom would say, come here. And my little brother would be kicking and kicking and kicking and kicking. He's going to be a football player, huh? What a beautiful pro-life image. No, my mom, this is your little brother. He's he's a boy. What a beautiful, what a beautiful lesson in pro-life of a good mom, huh? So you're called to use all creation and not to abuse. And you're going to be seeing now through these exercises, uh, we don't always use things perfectly. The exercises are called to order the disordered. Got that? To order the disordered. We have disorders in our life. That comes from sin. We want to be ordering the disorder. Okay? And the last part of principle and foundation, buckle your spiritual seatbelts now. Are you ready? Holy indifference. Some of you have done the exercise with me, okay? Holy indifference. Holy indifference means we don't want to be attached to any person, place, or thing, but only attached to God. So that we should we should not prefer. We should not prefer 
a long life to a short life. Should not prefer health over sickness. We shouldn't prefer riches over poverty. Man, the Americans don't like that baby, do they? Man. <laughs> I was born here, man. Huh? Not to prefer riches over poverty. We're all tainted by materialism. Can I tell you the first poem I wrote? I was eight years old. It's short. It's a couplet. A couplet. Okay? This is before my conversion. Are you listening? Green is the grass on the ground. Green is the money I have found. Ah. <laughs> This was post-conversion of Father Broom, huh? <laughs> and not to prefer even honors over humiliations, but to choose what is most conducive for the end for which you're created, the honor and glory of God and the salvation of souls. You know who lived this out? One of the greatest Mexican saints who we celebrate today. You don't even know who it is. Jose Luis Sanchez del Rio. It's his feast day today. Did you see the movie of the Cristeros? Remember the little boy that had his feet cut? He was hung from the church there in Santiago, Michoacan. And they told him to deny Christ, and he said, Listen to my Spanish. Que viva Cristo Rey? Que viva la Virgen de Guadalupe? And they shot him in the temple. When the blood was coming out of his temple, he took his thumb and made the cross with the blood on the ground there. And then he died. There you have holy indifference to the max. He preferred to die and to suffer rather than to deny Christ or Ray. Amen? Amen? So my friends, starting tomorrow, I'm going to be praying for all of you. I'm going to be making a novena. What? Can't hear you. Okay. So starting tomorrow, I'm going to be placing all of you on the altar for nine days that these exercises will radically transform your lives and all of you will become great saints. Amen. Amen. Would you like the blessing with St. Ignatius? Yes. Or next week? Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Through the intercession of St. Ignatius of Loyola, May God bless you during these exercises in the most special way and help you to become the saint that God has called you to in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so right now.